Thank you for the introduction. Um, so the first thing that you'll probably notice is that the uh, the title uh, is a little bit different from the one given in the poster. So actually, I, I changed it um, recently because um, I feel like um, I'm only going to introduce uh, layout synthesis, which is a part of the compilation process. There are many other stages in the compilation process. So I feel like I should restrict the title somehow. Um, yeah, so let's begin. So I will first introduce uh, some backgrounds on quantum bits and gates, and then I will introduce this problem called layout synthesis in quantum computing, uh, short for LSQC. Then before we actually go into how to solve it, we uh, first want to probe how good are the current solvers. So we invent this kind of benchmark for measuring optimality um, of LSQC solvers called Quico. And the third line of work is that we jump right into how to solve it. So this line of work is called OSC. So we formulate this problem into some um, optimization problems, and then we uh, invoke some existing solver to, um, to implement our solution. And then finally, I will also briefly introduce this new work um, uh, that is actually going to be presented uh, at ICCAD this year. Uh, it's about uh, to ask, but for reconfigurable architecture or programmable architecture, and this architecture is uh, implemented with atom arrays. So, any questions so far? Okay. Um. Yeah. So let's first cover some background. Um, so this here, we are just uh, talking theoretically what's, what is like the uh, mass between quantum computing, just to give some uh, uh, context. So classical bit is either zero or one, and uh, a qubit is a uh, vector in this uh, complex valued linear space spanned by two vectors. And um, but then we also have linear combinations um, with arbitrary coefficients. So it's much more rich than uh, classical bits. For n classical bits, it's a bit string of length n. And the um, qubit basis states are exactly like the bit strings. But then we, we again, we have a um, linear coefficients uh, and we can combine these uh, basis states. So we have uh, an qubit state, which is a vector in the span of uh, this two to the n basis states. A quantum algorithm produces a state from, uh, of interest from some fiducial state, usually it's an O zero state. And then measuring that um, final state would yield uh, one basis state with some probability. So um, probably you're already familiar with this. Uh, and since the quantum states are uh, vectors, the operators on these vectors are matrices. So that leads us to the quantum gates. Uh, we can look at some examples. Uh, actually, the specific content of these matrices is not really of interest to us today, but I'm just uh, writing this out to give you some context. So for example, we have this bit flip gate, which will flip the two coefficients. So it's like matrix representation is like this. Um, and we also have face flip gate C. And here, uh, actually, we run into uh, what we call the parameterized gate or um, programmable gate because we have uh, one variable in the gate, R phi, 
and it can take um, any value. And if we actually instantiate phi to pi, we will get the face exactly the face split gate we just seen. Uh, another uh, common gate is hard merge. And uh, we need entangling multi qubit gates to um, execute non trivial quantum computing. Uh, and the most common one are like C0. So, um, so, so, so here we have seen like theoretically what are qubits and what are quantum gates. Um, but then uh, let's also see it uh, in hardware, like what, what, does, what do those really mean? So this is a uh, superconducting QPU by IBM. And uh, quantum registers are physical entities that are much like classical registers in that they will store one bit, or like in this case, one qubit. So, uh, for example, this uh, little structure with two bars and some connection in the middle, this is a quantum register. So it in itself is a pretty complex quantum system. Like, you know, you have all these physicists uh, studying uh, the behavior of this system. Um, so I'm not just calling it a qubit because it's much more complex. So we uh, so actually we call it quantum register, and then we make use of some two states of the quantum register to be zero and one. And uh, the quantum gates are implemented by signals to the components on QPU. For example, you can maybe you can have some um, like a, a sign signal to this uh, input to this little pin, and then uh, you know, through this uh, winding structure, you will operate on the qubit. And um, entangling two qubit gates require coupling between two qubits. So coupling just means it's connected by some wire. And as you can see, uh, these qubits are not all to all coupled. That is actually what the motivation for this stage in compilation, the all synthesis. And uh, for, so this is only for the superconducting QPU, but for others, we all of these uh, principles still holds. For example, uh, tribe dyes, uh, neutral atom arrays, or silicon spin qubits. Okay, now we can introduce our problem, which is called layout synthesis. So this, uh, there are other names for these problems. Um, like some people may call it qubit mapping, qubit allocation. Um, some also call it like circuit transform for like executing on some architecture. Uh, people who have a lot of names for this problem. Um, but we, we call it layout synthesis because um, we think that it's similar to some classical circuit design process. So the input is um, either one of these. Uh, so these two are just two representations of the same thing. You can either uh, specify a quantum program by the list of gates or you can draw it as uh, this uh, diagram you see in textbooks. So for example, the first gate is X on Q0. Um, and you can see Q0 is uh, on the, uh, the, the wire on the top. And uh, we have the X gate on Q0. And the next one is X on Q1. So we, we can see that. There's also X gate on Q1. So, and this is uh, just some coupling graph of uh, representing a quantum register. So remember, we, we have just, um, just seen that uh, you need some physic 
physical uh, coupling between the qubits so that they can execute two gates. And usually it's not an O2O connection. So here, like the vertices are quantum registers and edges means uh, such a connection for two qubit gates. So what we need to do is that like here, the, the Qs, these are um, something like, you know, it, it's, it's not physical. You can call it logical qubits, but then just to avoid confusion with the quantum error correction term, we may call it like program qubits or some people call it virtual qubit. So we first need to map this program qubits to the quantum registers. And then, um, for example, this gate, uh, X gate on, Q, on Q0, you can see that it's like, uh, it's mapped to this quantum register. And uh, it turn out, turns out that single qubit gates can always be executed. So that is fine. Uh, and uh, the other single qubit gates I, I will just omit because uh, they can be executed. Uh, and let's look at this two qubit gate. So it's on Q2 and Q3. And uh, you find that, oh, okay. So these two quantum registers, they do have a connection. So uh, that is that is nice. And uh, what happens to this gate then? Let's see. So that is on Q0 and Q3. And uh, it's they are not adjacent on this graph, right? So then um, there's a problem because there's, an, there's no coupler between the Q0 and Q3. And then we cannot directly execute this gate. So what we can do is we can insert an additional gate called swap gate to change the mapping. So after the swap, the swap will exchange the content of the two registers. And then uh, you can see that Q0 got permuted to here. And uh, then, okay, Q0 and Q3, they are actually adjacent. So we can execute the gates. Um, one thing I want to point out is that this swap gate is uh, relatively expensive, uh, but then you have to do it to execute this circuit. So it's some necessary evil, I guess. Um, but we want the swap to be as few as possible in general. So just to make this more formal, the input of this program, LSQC, the synthesis for quantum computing, is that uh, um, the quantum circuit we want to run and the program or uh, O and the coupling graph. So like this too. And the output should be what we call space coordinates of all the gates, including the inserted swaps. Um, like we, we, we still see this quantum circuit diagram, but then note that we have explicit time coordinates on the bottom. So previously the vertical alignment doesn't mean anything, uh, but right now um, in this annotated uh, circuit diagram, we actually have like a logical time step uh, as the vertical alignment. And then the space coordinates are also uh, annotated on the wires of uh, program qubits. So for example, in the beginning, Q0 is mapped to P3. Uh, it's on the top right corner. And, but then after this swap gate, it got uh, permuted to P2. And then, uh, so these three C knots in the dash box, this, uh, this is, consists of a swap. Uh, there can be many objectives. Um, the most common ones are depths, which is the number of time steps or additional swap count. So here we only have one swap um, or fidelity, which is in itself a hard thing to define, but um, yeah, but um, like one simple definition is just a product of all the single like gate fidelities. 
uh, and we do have some constraints. Uh, for example, we want to execute all the gates. We want to respect the dependencies we, uh, because in general, quantum gates are not commutable. Uh, you cannot arbitrarily exchange the order of uh, any two of them. And then the swaps must be uh, valid. Like it cannot overlap with some other gates or uh, like two swaps cannot overlap as well. So, okay, so this is our uh, definition of the problem. Um, some a, a lot of people call qubit mapping, but we feel like uh, it's more than a mapping. Like you map it in the beginning, but then this mapping keeps on changing if we insert the swaps. So it's like a combination of mapping the qubits, but also um, inserting the swaps, some part, somebody calling inserting the swap as a routing. Um, so we feel like layout since this is like a classical term that uh, that can uh, encapsulate both of this. So that's the term I'm going to use today. Um, any questions so far? Okay, then I can introduce uh, Quackle, which is a uh, benchmark circuit for um, measuring optimality of this LSQC solver. Um, I think today I'm going to be more general and uh, skip some uh, technical details. Uh, you can look at the slides later on if you want. So uh, we have actually quite a lot of previous works on this problem. Um, some people process the circuit layer by layer or gate by gate or like use dependencies and then I mean, in the recent years, there are also quite a lot making use of machine learning. So one question is, um, are they good enough? So this is the first question my advisor asked me when I started my PhD. So if this are, um, so first we, we, we find that this problem is interesting, but then if these tools are already like 10% to the, optimal solution always, then uh, it doesn't make sense to invest, to, to invest like a few years looking into this problem as a PhD student. So um, we want to construct, uh, and then we also, on the other hand, know that this problem is NP hard. So it's impossible in general to come up with optimal solutions all the time. So then, it may still be possible to construct some circuits, some instances of this problem where we know the optimal solution. So these are special families of, the, of all the problem instances. So, and uh, then maybe by construction, we know the optimal solution. So then we can use that optimal solution to uh, measure how good are the others. So that is the idea between this work. Um, and the construction is actually quite simple. So we, uh, so these are depths and gate count optimal benchmarks, but the gate count is, uh, there's, like, uh, there's a little caveat we'll see later on. Um, so we start with a coupling graph and uh, target depths and something we call gate density. So, the target graph is just uh, the QPU that we are going to run. So here uh, is a little QPU. So, and then we can um, enforce a kind of a lower bound for the depths by growing a backbone. <laughs> um, so the backbone just means it's like a, a chain of gates and each one will depend on the previous one. So here we have a backbone of length three. So the existence of this chain of gates uh, means that remember we have to respect the dependency during the uh, layout census. 
So this dependency will be respected even in the solution. So in the solution, we can find this chain of, chain of gates as well. And none of them can be executed at the same time step. So that's why we know that um, this is optimal. Um, and after we uh, have this uh, backbone, we, we also sprinkle some other gates. Um, so because what it, so this is a very sparse circuit. So what if you want a denser circuit? Um, and these other gates are just uh, applied randomly because uh, we have already this backbone to uh, to make this work. And uh, finally, um, so if you just give the compiler um, the circuit right here, I will say, oh, okay, it's trivially mapped, right? Because we so we are we are only applying the gates uh, that is compatible with this uh, coupling graph. Um, so to make this more interesting, we will have a scrambling uh, of the qubit indices. So then it becomes not, um, not trivial. Uh, actually, the compiler can find out the solutions if it can find this uh, mapping. Yeah, and then like after the uh, this uh, random uh, permutation of the uh, of the index indices, we can uh, generate a circuit or like a cosm file. So again, if the if the compiler can reverse this mapping, you will find the optimal solution. Uh, and by optimal, we mean it will have the same um, depths with uh, like our original construction, which is optimal. Uh, and uh, it also have optimal gate count, which is zero, because if you can find this mapping, you can just find this circuit without any swaps needed. So any questions here? Okay, um, so we evaluated some existing tools with um, Quico. Um, so the, the, the these benchmarks are constructed. We want we want as realistic as possible. Although in general, Quico are some just artificial synthesis the benchmarks. So we pick the device with which we generate the the Quico circuits to be like these four, which are uh, representative back then. Um, and uh, we pick the depths. Remember, we can set the depths of the backbone, uh, which is the optimal depths uh, af after layout synthesis. Uh, and we can also set the gate density, like we because we can sprinkle the gates after we constructed uh, the backbone. So we can also control how much gates there are. And we tested uh, a few tools, circuit kit. Uh, TCAT and uh, this academic work. And uh, so, so these are steps from five to 45. We, we call them near-term feasible cases because the quantum supremacy experiment has uh, 45 layers of gates. And as you can see, there are, there are quite large gaps between the optimal and uh, what, what we are getting from this, this existing works. So because the y-axis here is a depth ratio, which is the depth returned by these different tools divided by the optimal depths. So as long as this is uh, larger than one, um, there is an optimality gap. And uh, some of this uh, behaves actually quite poorly. You, you can see that the, the optimality gaps is maybe 40x or something. And uh, so for the scalability study, we have a larger depths. And uh, uh, so, so here, the, on the left is for TCAT, on the right is for Qiskit. 
and you can see like this are all there there are some large optimality gaps. Any questions? So uh, when we identify these gaps, we decide that okay, we can actually spend some effort into this problem. Uh, so that leads to OSC, which is uh, our effort to trying to solve this problem optimally. And uh, mainly we formulate this problem uh, to some optimization model, and then we um, implement, implement the solution with uh, optimizers. So uh, we've, al we've already familiarized with the variables needed for generating the solution, right? So we need space-time coordinates we have introduced previously for uh, every gate. Um, and then we also need the mapping of qubits uh, at any time. Um, so for example, um, for qubit Q0, it's mapped to P3 in the beginning. So pi Q0 at time T0, this is T0, is three. Uh, and uh, at time one, it continues to be so until it runs into this swap gate, then it will be permuted to P2. So uh, these are the, the mapping variables. So we'll have one mapping variables for a one time step and one logic qubit or program qubit. Uh, also, we need the use of swap variables because the swap gates are different than the other gates uh, because we insert these swap gates. So we also need this decision variable. For example, there is only um, there is one variable for each edge in this graph at each time t, um, and um, we only have one swap in this solution. So there is only one of this variable that is one, and all the others are zero. So that one variable, uh, what edge this swap is on, is on p two p three, and it finishes at time seven. So that's Sigma of P2, P3, P and 7 will be 1. All the, for all the others, edges and uh, time steps, it will be 0. So this is generally a more uh, efficient encoding than this previous work, which is also optima, uh, optimal approach to this problem. Um, and um, so these are the, all the variables, space-time coordinates, mapping variables, use of swaps. We only have these three sets of variables. But we can we also need to specify the constraints so that um, if the solver returns some assignment, we know that uh, we can. Uh, it, it's a valid solution. Um, the simplest ones are validity constraints like. Uh, if GL is a single cubic gate, the its space coordinates should be uh, one vertex in the coupling graph. If it's a two cubic gate, then it should be a, it should be an edge. Uh, and also, for example, injective mapping uh, because it's, we map one program qubit to one quantum registers, we cannot map, map multiple program qubits to the same register. Um, and also the dependencies, um, if we use a DAG sort of a way to encode the dependency, uh, if, for example, G8 acts on um, G8 is a C0, it will act on both Q0 and Q1. Um, so it, it will be ex uh, executed after this previous gate, T gate on Q0, G, which is G4. So we have t of eight time coordinate of gate eight larger than t of uh, time coordinate of uh, gate four. 
Um, there are also other constraints, like the, the most uh, non-trivial ones um, are revolving around the swaps. For example, we have to uh, transform the mapping variables by the swaps. So I will jump over the details here for the sake of time. Um, yeah, you can have a glance at what these are. So all of these constraints, usually there are some like uh, is equal, like uh, if these two are equal, it will return zero, uh, one, otherwise it will return zero. So sometimes we have like this. And then we, we also have some Boolean logic, like uh, this uh, disjunction or like implies. So um, these constraints will make sure that we have a valid solution, but then we also want a good solution on top of validity. So uh, we can express uh, different objectives with these variables. For example, uh, depth, as we say, is uh, the maximum of all the time coordinates. Well, the swaps are if you uh, the summation of all the use of swap variables. And if you want to define fidelity in this product form, you can also express the this product fidelity of the circuit. So. Um, the point is that with these variables, it's you can basically express anything. So any questions here? So once we get the we we so to use an existing solver, we need to define the variables, we need to define the constraints, and then we give it the objective. And theoretically, like we can just uh, it's a push button, right? So we just wait for the results. Um, but then like the solvers are in generally quite slow and we also have, we, we've proven that, um, this problem in general is uh, MP hard. So it's definitely going to be slow. So we need to think of, um, ways to accelerate this process. The first heuristic we have is, um, this transition base idea. Um, so uh, we will uh, sacrifice some optimality for speed. Uh, the motivation is that mapping variables are redundant in the lack of swaps. So this is like the original problem. So we, so we we so right now we still have um, one mapping variables for each time step and for each qubit, right? Um, but then we find that there's only one swap, and before the swaps, the mapping variables will be the same for all the time steps, and after the swaps, it will also be the same for all the time steps. Um, so then we have a lot of redundant variables. So we can actually uh, um, if the we only keep the variables for um, what uh, the gate blocks between the between the swaps. So one gate block can consist of many uh, time steps. In this example, there are only two blocks versus 14 time steps. So we save a lot of variables. After we insert the swaps, we can use the scheduling. Um, you can schedule it as soon as possible or as late as possible or any other ways you want. In the, uh, in the final solution, like, the, the gate blocks and transitions looks like this. What's surprising is that this, um, so first the solver is finding this kind of partition for us. We're not 
manually setting a partition. So like the software can still be very clever about it. And the second surprising thing is that this uh, tech, this uh, relaxation technique requires uh, very little change to the constraints. So you can see that for most of these uh, sets of constraints, we don't uh, require any change. And we have a large speed up on like the, the benchmarks we use in the paper than the original uh, formulation. Um, we can also combine this with some other techniques uh, to, to, to relax. For example, we haven't considered commutation in the process, but like for some circuits like KOA, uh, all the two cubic gates are uh, commutable. So here I'm talking about only one iteration of QOA and only the uh, only the two cubic gates, like the phase gates. They are commutable because they are diagonal. So this this part of the circuit, for example, can be um, uh, permuted to this more parallelized version. And uh, using TBOSC, uh, we can already get some improvement than uh, this baseline, which is TCAT. So you can see like on the left is the swap count, on the right is the depths, we have uh, big reductions. Uh, we can also revise the constraints so that uh, the solver also explore commutation among these gates. So that is the brown theories uh, of data. And you can see that uh, there are some further reductions. Any questions so far? So we have seen original OSC formulation and also uh, TB OSC, which is a relaxation using this uh, transition idea. The final, uh, the final topic to the SQL is we call OSC GA. So GA stands for gate, of, gate absorption and uh, that is enabled by programmable two cubic gates. So programmable single cubic gates, we have this, uh, for example, in Qiskit, it's uh, it can be configured to any matrix in uh, the single cubic gate set because it has uh, different uh, parameters we can set. A program called two cubic gate is a generalization of uh, the single cubic gate, and it can be uh, decomposed using this uh, standard technique called KAK. So then we need a uh, three C nodes and um, some other single cubic gates to make a programmable two cubic gate, which can be configured to be any two cubic gate. And um, you can express many quantum programs with uh, this uh, programmable two cubic gates. For example, like in chemistry simulation, uh, we have this uh, kind of gate called FSIM, fermionic simulation gate. And it has two parameters. Um, here I'm taking both of them to be pi over four. And uh, after the decomposition, it looks like this. We have three C nodes. And for each of the programmable single cubic gates, we have like different values for the parameters. So this gives us some opportunity. Why is that? So let's see. Um, if I have a swap gate right after this simulation gate, so the, the swap gate for chemistry simulation is a little bit different from the standard swap gate. So we have an F here, just for correctness. So if we say, okay, we have these two gates, we want to decompose them using the standard procedure, you have two copies of uh, this template. 
right? So you have first you have to decompose the fsim to this template, and then after that you decompose the f swap. But actually, um, we can first find the matrices for these two gates, and then we get the product of the matrices, and then we decompose. We can do that because this template is general, right? It's for any two qubit gate. In that way, we only have one copy of this template. So we are saving 50% of the cost of imp implementing this gate, these two gates. So um, of course, like the swaps will exchange the, the qubit mapping. So we need to uh, also formulate this uh, gate absorption behavior into the model. And uh, we can actually do that quite elegantly. Um, but then we need to add another set of variables called absorbed swaps. So they are quite similar to the sigma variables, the use of swap variables. Uh, and the mapping is transformed by both absorbed and explicit swaps. So when we implement this, um, again, we use QOA as uh, the example. We can um, see that there are some further reductions than TBOSC. And what's surprising is uh, actually on the right uh, is the number of comparison on number of swaps. You can see that there is even no gray bar. So that's the data to uh, corresponding to OSC GA. So that means all the swaps are absorbed for this set of benchmarks. So this is like one effort of combining some uh, gate synthesis or logic synthesis with our layout synthesis problem. So by breaking this abstraction layer a little bit, we can get uh, this improvement. Any questions? And uh, if we evaluate the fidelity, um, but again, this is fidelity by that uh, very, um, very coarse model of product form, uh, we can see some big improvements because we have uh, less, way less gates. And that is because we have absorbed swaps and also TBOSC is um, inserting less swaps than the baseline uh, in the beginning. Okay, so finally we can um, take a glance at this uh, new work. Um, the motivation of this work is that we, we've seen this um, reconfigurable architecture, uh, which is very new, right? Um, what we mean by reconfigurable is that if you still represent this uh, architecture with a coupling graph like we used to, uh, that coupling graph can change during the computation. So this is not true for uh, the superconducting circuits because like, you have to rely on lithography to make the connections on the, on the superconducting QPUs. And you cannot change that once it's out of the fabrication, right? Um, but with some other... Um, platforms like atom arrays, you can actually um, reconfigure the architecture. So this um, also another, another selling point is that we, we can have many, many quantum registers. Um, in fact, this paper demonstrates larger than 200. We can play this little film by the physicist uh, to get a sense of uh, 
what it means to be reconfigurable. So in this film, every of this uh, dot is uh, one atom. And uh, the qubits are defined by some like two states of the atom. So when the atoms are close, like in, in the beginning, we have this uh, eight pairs of atoms that are close, circled by the, the red circles. And we illuminate them with laser, then this two, there can be a two cubic gates between this pair that is close. But the problem, uh, but the, the non trivial thing is uh, we have uh, these traps of atoms that are mobile called AOD. Like if you, if you uh, observe, like these eight qubits that finally move to the upright corner, these are mobile. So they are in these uh, traps called AOD traps. And uh, the other traps are stationary, like the atoms on the bottom left corner. So these are called SLM traps. With one mobile trap and one stationary trap, we can uh, change the location of the qubits, right? And then by changing the location of the qubits, we can change the coupling graph. The coupling graph here are just uh, uh, edges between these uh, pairs that are close. And the other, uh, the other uh, the the other atoms are just sort of dangling or like they're not connected to any other uh, any other atoms in the coupling graph. So this is what we mean by reconfigurable. The physicists uh, implemented several circuits related to quantum error correction in their paper, but then the problem is how can we execute any program with this architecture? Um, again, we, we take compiling some QOA program as example, because um, this QOA uh, on three regular graphs, max cut, uh, they, they, are gener they are induced by some random graph and uh, we can generate a lot of these uh, benchmarks. If we map that to Google Sycamore, we need three swaps for this fixed architecture. We, in this work, we formulated, again, the layout synthesis problem, but for the reconfigurable architecture, we also split the whole process into time steps like this. Here, like the, the blue, circles are the SLM atoms and the red circles are the AOD atoms. And the AOD atoms can move across different uh, stage of computation. And uh, we can generate solutions uh, that is similar to the animation we've had just seen. Like the, um, the, the AOD atoms, the right ones, they can move across different stages. At, at one stage, we have this green patches. That means uh, laser is illuminated on the pair of qubits. So there are some integrating two qubit gates. So I won't go into the details of like how do we formulate it. You can find the paper later this year <laughs> if you're interested. Um, but we use the same approach uh, as OSC just that, that this, uh, there are some other considerations when the architecture is reconfigurable. So there are, are no swaps in this solution. We don't require anything. Um, so that is a big advantage, three versus zero. Uh, we compare our work with uh, Sycamore plus TCAT, so this is the combination of hardware and compiler for the leading experiments in QOA. So this is a comparison 
uh, of the number of native entangling two qubit gates. For and uh, the x axis are the number of qubits in QA program. For each of these um, number of qubits, we generate the spherical graphs. We generate ten actually ten graphs, and then we map those ten graphs to the hardware. The red uh, series is uh, for Oscara, and uh, the brown series is for Sigma plus T five. There is a big gap between the required number of two qubit gates. Actually, uh, about six x at uh, the largest uh, size we've run. And if we evaluate the fidelity again based on that uh, product form, we can see that uh, also here f two is two qubit gate fidelity, and uh, t is a coherence time. The current um, estimations are the two uh, solid lines. So like sigma plus Tcat with their current F2 and T is this orange line. And um, Oscar is this uh, solid right line. There is a pretty large gap, about 14x at, the large, uh, at size 22. Uh, but then these atoms, they have super long coherence time than the super long qubit. So if we factor that out, the pure effect of reconfigurability is about 2x, which is still quite large. And we make different uh, uh, projections on different F2 and Ts. Uh, for example, uh, RAA, the reconfigurable atom ray with F2 equals to 99.4. So that's the current fidelity of sycamore. And uh, we keep the coherence time the same. So that is uh, the pink dashes. You can see that it's almost overlapping with the blue stars. So that is sycamore with 100 times of its current coherence time and the uh, fidelity of 99.9. Uh, so this will be very challenging for superconducting circuits to uh, to achieve. Okay, so that finishes everything. Any questions? Okay, thank you, uh, Daniel, for the introduct uh, for lecture. So I have a question before other people to ask. So for the last work here, so. Um, what is the overhead to move the, the qubits? So if the overhead is very small, we can basically consider that as the all to all connection, right? Uh, yes, it's... Um, so are you saying you just, if the, if the overhead of moving is, let's say zero then right yeah so is the bottleneck uh moving those items because if we just uh move the items like another animation you showed in next several slides that we can just uh move each of them using the light tweezers right and then for all all the two qubit gates we just move the qubit there and then apply the operation and then move away the qubit yeah, okay, so first is the cost. So the co there, there are some costs, but hmm. um, at least in that, uh, in our evaluation, like we also, we, we also compute that cost and hmm. we find that um, like it's uh, really small compared to the, uh, the entangling two qubit gates. Hmm. So at the current state, um, we are optimizing the number of stages, which are the number of times we turn on the regular laser to mm -hmm. have the entangling two qubit gates. So that is much higher an arrow source than mm -hmm. the moving. But if they keep on improving that gate, um, maybe we'll see that like we also need to have a term for movements in the mm -hmm. um, in the in the objective function. 
Uh, another another thing is like I agree with you that you can sort of imagine some very um, simple toy architecture to to mm -hmm. like arbitrarily execute anything. Mm -hmm. um, but then the problem like is that you want to do it in a parallel way, right? So here you see that this eight like you're almost having eight gates at the same time, or like every stage. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that parallelism is challenging because this uh, AOD traps, they move like linearly in 2D together, okay. right? So you have okay. this row and these columns. Mm -hmm. The rows will be rows all along and columns will be columns all along. So mm -hmm. if you want to enable this parallelism, you, you need like, you know, mm -hmm. the constraints between these different qubits. So that okay. is non-trivial to human intuition like so we have to move those together uh yeah in... so they move by rows and columns so that's okay. what is what i think mm -hmm. yeah you don't have so... like individual control mm -hmm. on each qubit you have individual control on each row and each column okay interesting mm. yeah that's very interesting <laughs> yeah so if you don't I want any parallelization, you can you, you can easily like execute mm -hmm. anything right right yeah so the so the cost of just move one row or one column is uh is smaller than moving each of them, right? Um otherwise I, I, I don't I don't I don't know because like it's not um so it's more related to the the time of a movement or like the distance mm -hmm. of the movements okay mm. so like yeah so you already yeah i mean it also depends on like basically uh when you perform a movement what is the longest distance mm -hmm. that an atom can move okay i see yeah. mm. so when you move the item will that uh introduce a large error no actually because they uh like in the in, in the value in the evaluation we have the so when we are um estimating this fatality we add in that term but then that term is always larger than 95 percent mm -hmm. for all these cases mm -hmm. but like for example like turning on that regular laser is like one time is like 97% or something. Mm -hmm. So that is the main error source. I see, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. these movements are really high fidelity compared to gate operations. I see. Yeah, because in the in a trapped ion, we, we also have the movement of the ions, um, but that will incur the, the heat and that will reduce the error, reduce the fidelity. So one, criteria or one optimization goal in the neutral uh, in, in the trapped ion is to reduce the shuttling but it seems that in the neutral item is not the bottleneck yeah yeah that is a very good point i think it's different because these trappings are making use of different physics phenomena mm. like trap okay. ions like you know that that interacts with the electric field mm -hmm. but um like i think for optical tweezers this uh, it's a relatively clean uh, clean method of mm -hmm. uh, trapping. Yes, I see. Yeah, interesting. Cool. So, right. So, uh, any other questions from the audience? <laughs>